everyone, I'm Amy James, the co-inventor of Open Index Protocol. Welcome back to the What Kind of Internet Do You Want series. Please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel, and let's get into it. Do you want to consume content without spending money or uh, sailing the high seas? <laughs> Or are you a content creator who wants to give away content for free, but still make money without ads or sponsors? In this video, we're going to talk about how profoundly broken the web's ad model is and how Web3 offers new solutions. So first, let's talk about what is wrong with the advertising model. It's the primary revenue model for the web today. It's the model that we're up against in trying to fix things, and it is very, very very broken. One of the inventors of the pop-up ad has called advertising the internet's original sin. There's a fantastic book about this problem called Subprime Attention Crisis, and it says that it's impossible to think about the future of the web without thinking about the future of advertising. And as you can tell from the title, the book centers around the analogy of how the financial markets and the 2008 collapse are similar to current online advertising markets. This is the main thesis of the book. The divergence between the asset being bought, ad inventory, and the asset underlying it that defines its value, attention, directly parallels what happened to collateralized debt obligations, CDOs, during the 2007-2008 crisis. I'm a big fan of analogies, so much so that I will kind of stretch one to make it work if necessary. And this is uh, precisely the issue that we're talking about. Because even though I know a lot about tech, I really don't like going into all of my little settings and adjusting all that stuff and like finding that thing and oh my gosh, they updated something and now I have to look at it again. I would much rather proxy that to someone I trust. It's my favorite analogy for this is cutting my hair because I could cut my own hair, like it's possible. Um, but I prefer to outsource that service to somebody who I trust. Right. You guys, what do you do about your hair, by the way? So. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but the analogy between the financial markets and online advertising markets doesn't need any stretching. It is spot on. Maybe it's more than an analogy. Maybe the ad model is more like an outgrowth of the financial markets because the roots of connection go deep. Most of the advertising marketplaces that are used today were created by people who had previous careers as brokers and traders in the financial industry. That's how connected they are. And purchasing ad space is generally done with real-time bidding software, which is extremely similar to high-frequency trading. Let me just read a little bit more about how insane the system is. One of the most incredible aspects of the RTB real-time bidding system is that the entire process takes place in real time. The advertisements you see online are not predetermined. At the moment you click the link and load up the page, a signal from the ad server triggers an instantaneous auction to determine which ad will be delivered. The highest bidder gets to load its ad on the website and into your eyeballs. This process happens at the speed of light. The inventory must be bid upon and the actual advertisement delivered in the split second moment between when you click to load something online and the time that the website or content on an app is finally loaded. The entire process of putting out a request for bids, making bids, evaluating the bids, and delivering the advertising takes place in under a hundredth millisecond, 100 milliseconds. That's about a quarter of the time it takes you to blink. This happens millions and millions of times across the internet every second without ceasing and largely without hiccups. Pretty incredible, right? Advertising in digital media generated an estimated 237 billion, with a B, in global revenue in 2018, and industry analysts expect estimate the online advertising market will almost double, growing to 427 billion by the year 2022. Marketers love machine learning, AI campaigns, and data-driven advertising because it looks great in analytics dashboards and attribution models, but it really is just theater. They aren't accurate, and research has shown 
that they don't increase sales revenue. Plus, most of the customer data that advertisers are selling is terribly inaccurate. So the fraud basically breaks down into two categories, fake attention and fake inventory. Fake attention involves things that we've all seen in the news, click farms of people, automated scripts for clicks, that kind of thing. In 2014, Google released a report suggesting that 56% of all ads displayed on the internet are never seen by a human. <laughs> the size of this problem is truly jaw-dropping and honestly fairly terrifying when you consider its implications for the web economy. A study conducted by Adobe in 2018 found that about 28% of websites showed non-human signals indicating that it originated from automated scripts or in click farms. Another study predicted that the advertising industry would lose 19 billion to click fraud in 2018. That's a loss of about $51 million per day. And some estimate it's even higher with claims that $1 out of every $3 spent on advertising is lost to click fraud. Fraud accounts for 22% of video spend and 20% of non-mobile video traffic is driven by bots. And the problem is even worse with video ads than with display ads, with one study finding fraud twice as common with video traffic as in display. And this little factoid I found really shocking. In fall of 2016, 87% of all mobile devices in the programmatic advertising market were fraudulent, meaning that they were either not real phones or they were phones running automated scripts. But either way, the ads were unseen by any potential customers. 87%. Oh, quick sidebar. You know that popular idea that Bitcoin energy consumption is wasteful? That idea is wrong, by the way. Bitcoin actually incentivizes energy efficiency, but that's obviously a topic for another video. But if you do care about wasteful energy and resource consumption, then you really should be concerned about the extreme amount of waste in the digital distribution market. The walled garden model is incredibly wasteful. I covered this in detail in a talk that I gave at the Texas Bitcoin conference. So we'll link that in the description below if you want to check it out. But in a nutshell, each company is storing and distributing unnecessarily redundant copies. Think of the catalogs of iTunes and Spotify. They're basically the same. The network architecture inherently has massive waste by how it's designed, but advertising fraud adds a whole new level to this waste. The bots and farms that are watching these videos are consuming unnecessary resources and wasting a tremendous amount of energy. Okay, sidebar over. Another way that it's similar to the 2008 crisis is that the agencies involved in buying and selling the ads have a conflict of interest. Arbitrage is a major component of marketing agencies' revenue streams, but it places what is best for the agency at odds with the advertiser that they are supposed to be representing. What they do is they buy ad space for a lower price and then sell it to their clients at a markup. This seems reasonably benign, but because of the opacity of the advertising marketplace, it has become unintentionally predatory. Similar to how the ratings agencies had conflicting interests in the 2008 subprime mortgage crisis to give triple A ratings to high risk loans, Marketing agencies are incentivized to give figurative triple A ratings to sell this low value ad inventory because it directly affects their bottom line. And these arbitrage sales often make up a huge percentage of 
the agency's revenue. Reliance on advertising is at the heart of what is wrong with the internet today. In the book, Huang says that the natural outcomes of an advertising-based business model are surveillance profiling and bias toward inflammatory content, and he forecasted looming danger. Let me just read one more quote that I underlined. The internet we have, for better or worse, is yoked to the structure and prospects of the advertising economy. If this system of advertising is brittle, the internet as we know it is brittle. Reading that hit me like a ton of bricks. I mean, I obviously knew that we're undergoing a revolution on the internet and that the transition from web two to web three will include changes to the foundational architecture of the web as we know it, but I hadn't really thought about how potentially catastrophic it would be for the internet advertising bubble to pop. <laughs> Looking at the inflation of ad value is what really drove it home for me. The click-through rate has changed by almost 10,000 times. In 1994, banner ads had a click-through rate of 44%. Today, a comparable banner ad gets a click-through rate of just 0.46%. At the end of the book, Huang suggests that fixing the problem may have more parallels with 1929 than with 2008. The panic in 1929 wasn't driven by the kinds of technical issues that were behind the 2008 financial collapse, like the real-time bidding system, marketplace opacity, bad incentives, falling asset values. The crash of, 29, of sorry, 1929 was because of trust. There was no way to know what asset value could be trusted and what couldn't. So the solution that was used then that Huang suggests that we use now is enforcing transparency through disclosure regulation. Now, I'm all for transparency, but I'm skeptical that new regulation is the best path. I tend to prefer technical solutions over government regulation whenever possible. And I believe that these problems can be fixed using blockchain and other decentralized technologies as we build Web3. Given that kids today don't know about the origins of the save icon or like how to burn CDs, I feel like we should just take a moment to remind us all that products like email were originally fee-based businesses. Services like spam filtering and storage were typically subscription-based, but then free services like Gmail changed this by using advertising. Around Alexandria Labs, we like to say that history might not repeat exactly, but that it most certainly rhymes. And we see these cyclical patterns everywhere in the history of the country, in the financial industry, in the music industry, in the advertising industry. And one of the cycles that we're seeing repeat in the advertising industry right now is the sponsored content model. Think back to advertising on TV in the 50s and 60s. They had commercials, but they also had sponsored content. You remember? This program brought to you by... Leave it to Beaver has been brought to you by Ralston Purina, makers of the eager eater dog food, Purina Dog Chow. And how? We're now seeing a new cycle of the sponsored content model with YouTubers and other influencers. You've no doubt seen them before. They look something like this. Before we go any further, I'd like to say a big thank you to Grant for the Web for sponsoring today's video. Grant for the Web is a $100 million fund to boost open, fair, and inclusive standards and innovation in web monetization. It was funded by COIL in partnership with Mozilla and Creative Commons. We've been honored to be part of Grant for the Web's first cohort of awardees and highly recommend working with them if you are working on a monetization project for Web3. Check out more at grantfortheweb.org. We are seeing the rise of sponsored post popularity for two main reasons. 
safety for brands, and income for creators. Even among the most well-resourced companies in the world, brand safety has remained a persistent problem. Who remembers the uh, ad apocalypse? <laughs> Working directly with creators rather than through the opaque commodity ad markets gives brands more control over where their ads are placed. And creators love sponsored content because it pays them so much more money. For example, YouTube pay varies by genre and country and some other factors, but the average is around two to eight dollars per thousand views. And although the rate for a sponsored post can vary dramatically, it's typically at least five to 10 times more. In 2017, the Internet Creators Guild recommended that the median price for a sponsored video should be about three cents per view, which works out to $30 per thousand views, which is at least three times more than YouTube pays. The pricing for sponsored posts is not cut and dry. These deals can be put together in all kinds of ways, just from compensation with free product to compensation based on the number of views the video gets to an affiliate program where the creator gets a percentage of the sales that they drive or maybe a combination of these. So while sponsored posts definitely have advantages, they also have some strong disadvantages because compared to using a commodified ad service, the creator has a significantly higher administrative work, pitching, managing, and billing the sponsored posts. But I think that there's a much more significant structural limitation to this model because even if a creator were to scale their business to have every single post or video be sponsored and even hire a team to su help support them manage it, there is still a limit to their income because they can only do so many sponsored posts in a year. Assuming that they are paid a simple flat fee for a sponsored post, if a video goes viral, the creator doesn't get any additional financial benefit from the post. The incentive model for the creator doesn't encourage them creating the kind of content that will make money based on view count or long tail revenue. It's only about that one transaction, meaning that this model puts much more incentive on creating quantity than quality. And while there is certainly nothing wrong with a fast or high volume content creation process, an incentive model that only works for that one style leaves a lot of creators in the cold. Whereas with a commodified ad, the number of people that see the video does directly affect how much the creator will make. And this opens up a variety of monetization strategies for creators. Perhaps they focus on high production evergreen content like CGP Grey that will get a huge number of views and continue to generate tail revenue, but only release once per month or per quarter. Basically, the way I see it, the sponsored post model can scale up to a point but the commodified ad model could theoretically scale higher and be more flexible. But right now, the commodified ad model isn't scaling as well as it should because the incentives are bad and it's becoming more and more fraudulent. So it's scaling on a rocky substructure, but it can be fixed. Just because the way ads have been commodified is bad, doesn't mean that commodified ads are bad. What if commodified content could be monetized with transparency between the various parties, plus have additional monetization options? The solution, and if you've been around for a while, I'm sure that this will come as a huge shock, is blockchain. By using crypto to distribute and sell content, a whole world of options opens up to both platforms and users. There are lots of ways you can participate in and contribute value to these systems, and you can exchange the value you provide for content. So you aren't paying for it directly out of your paycheck. You're paying for it by letting a program run on your computer 
or you are paying for it by voluntarily sharing some anonymized demographic information with a marketer or watching an ad in exchange for tokens that then you use to watch content. The key is that it's voluntary and you have control rather than giving away your personal information without really knowing what they are collecting about you as we do in the current system. Using new blockchain tools feels like you're getting the content for free because you're just running a program in the background on your computer. You don't have to do any extra work or spend any extra dollars from your paycheck. So it's not strictly free. I guess the cost is having to install the program, but after that, it's functionally free. And it's not just for end users. Platforms can also integrate this into their services to help them stand out in the marketplace and to give their creators and users the benefit of these features while simultaneously reducing their overhead costs. Platforms can also integrate ad aggregators that use tokens and decentralized ID systems like Solid and Metami to give their users the option to get content for free by watching ads or sharing demographic information. The point is that these new systems can match all of the features available on the web as it is today, and they can unlock some really cool new features that weren't previously possible. Also technology like WebTorrent and JS IPFS can be used by platforms to help them harness the power of their user base to fight against censorship. If they're having trouble with services like Cloudflare or Amazon Web Services, but that's probably would be better covered in a whole other video. <laughs> the bottom line is that transparency is a prerequisite for market stability and the current advertising market is opaque and corrupt and threatens the web as we know it. But the good news is that Web3 is being built now by nerds like us all over the world and by using blockchain and other decentralized technology and the knowledge that has been gained from the previous 30 years of building the internet, I believe that the web can be not just fixed, but truly realize its full potential. It's an exciting time to be a nerd. <laughs> If you want to talk with me more about how you can get content without paying for it or stealing it, or if you are a platform or creator and want to give away content for free but still make money, hit me up on Twitter or Instagram at Amy of Alexandria and follow the channel at Open Index Proto. And don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, and share the video out. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. We're now seeing a new cycle of the sponsored coat idea that Bitcoin Grant for the Web is a $100 million fund to boast yeah. web.org. I, I think you're off. You We've been honored to be part of the... So close. I see Thanks now why people that are on air like have somebody who just like comes over and does that does this every time they restart because it gets all messed up and you look time. you look yeah. disheveled like look every good. time. Platforms can integrate ag ad. Why do I say ag aggregators? We're not farming.